Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of week two of the semester. First, we're going to do the recap on the last topic that we talked about yesterday in class. So the last concept that we learned in class was how to determine the overall polarity of a molecule. So whenever we have a molecule that we're trying to understand its overall polarity, and please do not confuse overall polarity with bond polarity, They're different things, okay? When we're trying to understand overall polarity, in other words, molecular polarity for a given molecule, first, we need to write it's Lewis dot structure. So that's the first thing that we need to take into consideration. Then we need to do, other than getting the correct structure, assign correctly what is the electron group geometry for that molecule. Based on electron group geometry, as you can see on the left side of the slide, then we can determine if my molecule has the correct conditions to be polar or nonpolar, okay? So as you can see, if you're a linear molecule, you need to have two identical bonds, okay? Pointing in opposite directions. That's why we tend to write our molecules symmetrically left to right. If you're a trigonal planar molecule, we need three identical bonds. When it comes to four, uh, when it comes to tetrahedral, we need four identical bonds, as you can see in the structure. Remember that identical, as you can see in the notes here, identical in terms of the attachments to the central atom means that the central atom is going to be attached to a single type of atom. It doesn't matter the bond, okay? So with that, now that we know how to assign the polarities, understand that next week for lab five, you guys will be practicing Lewis structure. So I'm going to encourage you to actually at least go through the lab sheet in order to get ready for the exam, which is next week, Friday, Saturday, okay? You guys will be doing similar exercises in which you are giving a list of molecules. You need to generate the Lewis structure, determine the electron group geometry, molecular shape, and molecular polarity. So this whole discussion of molecules and overall polarity leads us to talk about attractive forces. Okay? So what are attractive forces? Attractive forces are going to be the forces that are found between molecules. That's why sometimes we refer to them as intermolecular forces. Inter means in between, and then molecular refers to molecules. In table 6.18, you have a summary of the different types of forces that exist in between molecules. Now, as you can see, the ones that exist between molecules are going to be the ones in the bottom. The ones in the top are between atoms within a molecule, okay? So the ones on the top, either ionic bond or covalent bond, refer to what we call intramolecular forces. Again, intra because it's going to be inside of the molecule. So that's why it is between the atoms or ions in a molecule. Now you can see in this table, and let me specify that you need to use this table in exam two. When we are understanding this, understand that the, in terms of strength, the weakest forces are going to be in the bottom of the table. And as we move up in the table, the strength of the force increases. So what does that mean? 
when we're looking at this table in terms of intramolecular forces, it is known that an ionic bond is going to be stronger than a covalent bond. Now, when it comes to the intermolecular forces or attractive forces, as you can see, dispersion forces are going to be weaker compared to dipole-dipole attractions and dipole-dipole attractions are going to be weaker than hydrogen bonding. So how do we define each of these? Let's focus now on the components and let's define them. The idea of ionic bonds versus covalent bonds, it is something that we discussed in the beginning of the chapter, okay? So if you have a particular compound and it is an ionic compound, then it's going to have an ionic bond, okay? If you have a covalent compound, they are going to have covalent bond. Now, if I ask you which one is going to have the more strength in terms of intramolecular forces, then your answer has to be the ionic bond compared to any covalent bond. Now, the forces that we see in the bottom, okay, in between molecules, in this course, we particularly study them in terms of covalent bonding, okay? And this is, by definition, what is each of them? Starting with the bottom one, which is dispersion forces. So what is a dispersion force? Understand that a dispersion force is a temporary shift in the electrons in nonpolar bonds, okay? So what happens is that any molecule, okay, has electrons. As we have learned already, those electrons are going to be circling, 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 circling. And temporarily, they may just move to one side of the molecule. Okay. When they move to that one side of the molecule, then that makes the nucleus of the atom go to the other side of the molecule. That's why you see that delta positive, delta minus. Then what happens is that, for example, when you have this happen, this creates kind of like a chain reaction. Okay. It's not really a reaction, but like, uh, a consequence, a chain consequence. So it's just, you know, events happen after. And what happens is that all the atoms temporarily create those dipoles. So for example, here we have a molecule of F2, which is molecular fluorine. Remember that fluorine is one of those molecules that is diatomic. So temporarily, let's say that the fluorine that is on the right is going to pull some of that electron density towards it. And you can see that when a molecular fluorine is interacting with another molecule of F2, they're going to be interacting um, with one another by those temporary dipoles, okay? So they're called temporary dipoles because once the electrons start circling again, then those dipoles disappear. Now, let's also notice that the interaction of this dispersion force is illustrated right here. And it is in between that partial positive and partial negative charge that are in these fluorines, okay? Now let's proceed to talk about dipole-dipole attractions. And when it comes to dipole-dipole attractions, understand that dipole-dipole attractions are going to be present mainly in polar molecules. Okay, so if your molecule is polar, then you don't have temporary dipoles. You have permanent dipoles. Somebody's going to get a delta plus, somebody's going to get the delta minus. So when you have many of these molecules together, then you can see that having this permanent dipoles
is going to cause that when they are next to one another, then similarly, we can see that the interaction is between that partial negative pole to the partial positive pole of the neighboring molecule, okay? Now, we also have what are called hydrogen bonds, okay? And hydrogen bonds are very specific. When you have a hydrogen bond, you need to have a polar molecule where hydrogen is bonded to a quote unquote fun element, okay? So if hydrogen is not bonded to fun, then it's not going to undergo hydrogen bonding. What do I mean by fun? Fun, F-O-N, is the symbols for the elements that hydrogen must be attached to. Fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So those two parameters must be met. You need to be polar, hydrogen needs to be bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, in other words, fun, in order for a molecule to have hydrogen bonding, okay? So you can see here in the example that we have, specifically, we see how HF has a permanent dipole, so that's why it is a polar molecule. But more importantly, when we look at HF, the partial negative, which is where the fluorine is, is interacting with the partial positive of the neighboring molecule. Understand that these, that's why they're called attractive forces. We're going to have in the case for the attractive forces or intermolecular forces, always a delta plus, delta minus attraction in between the atoms. Okay, but it depends on the type of molecule that you have, okay, what attractive force is going to be present. Understand that the concept of attractive forces, it is so important, not only in general chemistry, but also organic chemistry and biochemistry. So you need to remember the concepts of attractive forces because we will see it play out again and again whenever we're trying to explain how things are interacting to one another or with one another in terms of molecules, okay? So similar to the example that I was giving you guys yesterday, okay? Um, these attractive forces uh, at times will even explain how two molecules will be able to dissolve into one another, but we are going to explain those topics in details in chapter nine. Any questions about attractive forces? Excellent. Now, where else do we see these attractive forces playing a role? Well, in the melting point of compounds. When we observed and we compared the melting points, of different compounds, the strength of the attractive force, okay, is going to be telling us specifically which one will be having a higher melting point compared to others. So here I have a list of compounds and you can see how we have on the top ionic compounds. And when we compare ionic compounds to covalent compounds, which the covalent compounds and start from water all the way down to F2, we can see that by looking at the numbers only, we can already determine that ionic compounds have a higher melting point compared to covalent. Now, when it comes to covalent compounds, so starting from water all the way down to uh, the fluoride diatomic molecule, we can see that because hydrogen bonding is actually stronger than dipole-dipole and dispersion forces, those molecules are going to have 
higher melting point compared to the other two. So as you can see, the strength of the attractive force. And remember, if we try to determine, okay, what is the strength? These are going to be weaker down here, and these are going to be strong all the way here. So the stronger the attractive force, the higher the melting point, okay, for a particular molecule. Now, in this course, you also need to be able to determine, and so sorry that the image is a little bit on the blurry side, but I think it's legible still. You need to be able to determine what are the attractive forces that are going to be present in a particular molecule. As you can see, following this flow chart, you will be able to determine what are the attractive forces found in a particular molecule, starting with the question, do you know if the compound that you're working with is polar? Once you determine this, okay, if the answer to the question is the compound polar is no, meaning that the compound is not polar, then London dispersion forces, okay, because that's another term that is utilized to describe them, or in other words, dispersion forces are going to be the more prevalent in that molecule. If your molecule is polar, okay, so you go to the yes, then you have to ask yourself another question. If my molecule is polar, then you need to ask, is hydrogen bonding possible? Remember that hydrogen bonding, as I just mentioned, means that H is bonded to any element that is fun, okay? If the answer is no, then the attractive force is going to be dipole-dipole. If the answer is yes, then you have to say, okay, is this compound an ionic compound? If the answer is no, then hydrogen bonding is going to be the strongest attractive force in that compound. If we're dealing with an ionic compound, then that means, that the strongest attractive force there is going to be ionic bond. When, as I mentioned throughout this chapter, an ionic bond is going to have electrostatic interaction because of the full charges of the cation and anion. So let's practice. trying to determine the strongest attractive force for the molecules that we were dealing with. So let me just make a few modifications to this. So we have the notes completed. Let me just bring the image for the flow chart that we can utilize. Ooh, doesn't want to move. There you go. Excellent. So one of the things that I want to remind you guys, because I know that it is in the chapter quiz, that 
there is a difference when the question prompts you to determine what is the strongest attractive force versus what is the strongest. So the strongest attractive force from all of the forces that are present in the molecule, okay? So let me just make a little table that is going to define if we have a nonpolar molecule, versus a polar molecule, okay? So that's what the term polar and nonpolar define. And let's look and categorize them based on the different forces that we talked about, starting with dispersion, followed by dipole-dipole, and lastly, H-bonding. So in a nonpolar molecule, let me just create a few more lines to complete my table. So in nonpolar molecules, we have dispersion forces. In polar molecules, we also have dispersion forces. The reason why polar molecules have dispersion forces is because by definition, any atom that has electrons will have dispersion forces. Guess what? Any molecule is going to have electrons. So that's why they have dispersion forces. Now, for polar molecules, dispersion forces is not the only force. For nonpolar molecules, dispersion forces is the strongest. Polar molecules can have dipole dipole interactions also. Okay. Now, if I have a polar molecule, in order for H bond to be present, okay, remember that this is only for polar molecules that have H bonded to a fun atom. So if the question is, what are all the forces? The answer is going to be different from when if I ask what is the strongest force. So I want to utilize the four molecules that we already determined their polarity. And then we're going to answer those specific questions. What are all the forces versus what is the strongest force? So I'm just going to use different colors in my pencils to define what are all the attractive forces. found in the molecule versus what is the strongest attractive force let's get started with the case of h2s following the table that i just developed what are all the attractive forces or actually, let me do the attractive forces with letters. So if I say that dispersion is A, dipole-dipole is B, H-bond is C, okay? This is will allow students to also participate in the chat. Let's put the letters in the chat for all the attractive forces found in H2S. What are all the attractive forces found in H2S? Excellent job, A and B.
Now, if I ask you the question, what is the strongest attractive force out of A and B that is present in H2S? Great job, letter B, okay? So for those students that are just re-watching this after class, make sure that you follow the color coding and letter coding that we are discussing right now in order for you to keep track of the answers. Let's move on to BEBR2, beryllium bromide. What are all the attractive forces found in beryllium bromide? Great job. The letter A, dispersion forces. What is the strongest force found in BEBR2? Excellent, there's only one answer. Dispersion forces. For those students that may be like, I don't understand how they're following this. All we are doing is, if we look at the questions, we already know the polarity of this molecule. Notice H2S is polar. BBR2 is nonpolar. So if we use the flow chart, okay, is the compound polar? Okay. For the case of H2S, the answer is yes. Okay. So we know that we have to move on. Is hydrogen bonding possible? The answer is no. That's why we selected dipole dipole as the strongest attractive force. That's why the letter B was given to H2S. But as you can see, London dispersion forces, which is right above it, are also present because of electrons, okay? In the case of BEBR2, we know that overall the molecule is nonpolar. So if you follow the flow chart on the left, is the compound polar? The answer is no. So you stay at London dispersion forces. Let's move on to SO3. We know that SO3 is nonpolar. So all of the forces and the strongest force is going to be the same. What's gonna be the letter? That are all of the forces present in SO3? Excellent. All the forces present are dispersion. The strongest force is gonna be dispersion. Because remember, for nonpolar molecules, you only have one choice. Dispersion forces is, are all the forces present. And um, also, when it comes to uh, the molecule, strongest force is going to be also dispersion, okay? Let's move on to the last one. In the last one, we can see that HCN is a polar molecule. So what letter or letters define what are all of the forces present there? What are all of the forces present in HCN? Excellent. A and B are all the forces. Dispersion and dipole dipole. Now, what is the strongest attractive force that we have in HCN? The letter B, dipole dipole. Remember that dispersion forces are weaker than dipole dipole. Okay. Now, one more thing that I want to mention, which is in the chapter quiz that you guys need to take uh, into consideration. Okay. And that is if I have two molecules that are interacting with one another, how do I determine what is going to be all of the attractive forces that are there or the strongest attractive force for them? 
So for this, I'm just going to um, just draw some molecules and we're going to look at the different cases. So give me a moment. Excellent. So I'm going to give you guys a moment to just draw these Lewis structures that we have here. Excellent. As you can see in the instructions, what we're going to try to define is going to be the strongest attractive force found in the interaction of these two molecules. Okay, so we're going to apply all of the knowledge and the concepts that we have learned in chapter six. When you look at the two molecules that are paired in letter A, here we have molecular oxygen on the top, and then we have molecular nitrogen in the bottom, okay? Utilizing P or for polar or NP for nonpolar. Are these molecules polar or nonpolar? Utilizing P and NP to categorize them. Are these molecules polar or nonpolar?
Okay, the chat is kind of quiet. Excellent. Those molecules are nonpolar. For those students that are like, wait, what? How do I know? Oxygen is a linear mo or molecular. Oxygen is a linear molecule. As you can see on either side, it has the same atom. So that's why it's nonpolar. Nitrogen, another linear molecule. On either side, it has the same atom. Both molecules are nonpolar. So if you have two nonpolar molecules and they are interacting with one another, remember that they're going to have temporary dipoles. And let's say that this is temporarily delta plus, this is temporarily delta minus, this is temporarily delta minus, this is temporarily delta plus. Their interaction, I'm going to do by um, just drawing some green dotted lines, will be between the temporary delta minus interacting with the temporary delta plus. What will be the designation of that interaction? What is that attractive force, the strongest that we can find? Dispersion dipole dipole or h bond you have two nonpolar molecules what's going to be the strongest attractive force between them excellent dispersion Let's move on to letter B, okay? In letter B, on the top, we have methanol. On the bottom, we have hydroxyl amine, okay? Out of the two, the one in the top, we're going to learn how to name in chapter 12. I'm just introducing at least the molecules. So similar to the questions that we asked on A, okay? Are these molecules polar or nonpolar? Excellent. Both molecules are polar. So this is a polar molecule and this is a polar molecule. For those students that are like, how do you know that these molecules are polar? Think about them. If you think of the atoms, which you can choose, at least in the case of the CH3OH, carbon or oxygen, they are going to be tetrahedral molecules that do not have four identical bonds surrounding the central atom. So that's what makes it polar. If you look at hydroxyl amine, similarly, if you look at the nitrogen or the oxygen for central atoms, they're both tetrahedral centers that do not have the identical bonds around them, the four that are needed in order to be nonpolar. So that's why both of them are polar, okay? Now, specifically, when we look at the polarity of the different bonds that are here, we can see that specifically, when we look at oxygen-hydrogen bond, Oxygen, is going to be delta negative. Hydrogen is going to be delta positive. Again, similarly, oxygen, delta negative. Hydrogen, delta positive. Remember that in the case of polar molecules, these are permanent dipoles. Okay, so you could think about it that way. The question in the chat is no central atom is a hint um, 
to them being nonpolar, it depends on the molecule. For the majority of molecule, molecules that you guys will be seeing in chemistry 104, the answer will be yes. Okay. But it depends if the molecule has symmetry, that then you have to look at other factors. But at least in this um, class, um, you can consider for the molecules that we are introducing to you guys uh, in chapter six, that that statement could be true. Now, when we look at the interaction between these two, again, I'm going to do it with dotted lines. The interaction is in between this delta positive and this delta negative. So what is the strongest attractive force between CH3OH and NH2OH? Excellent. This is illustrating hydrogen bonding. Questions about letter A or letter B? Then I'm going to give you guys two minutes to rationalize what's going to be the strongest attractive force between the pair on letter C and the pair on letter D. Excellent. For letter C, what is the strongest attractive force between those two molecules? Excellent job. Dipole, dipole attractions. Okay. So each of these molecules is a polar molecule. Okay. Now, 
when it comes to these molecules, okay, understand that because phosphorus, okay, has that lone pair on it, it's going to be more electronegative than hydrogen. So this is delta minus and this is delta plus. The reason why I make that distinction is that if you make the calculation for a phosphorus hydrogen bond, you will notice that a phosphorus hydrogen bond is actually nonpolar. So then you remember the rules that I gave you yesterday is that we only use these dipole for polar covalent bonds. In this case, the reason why I'm putting that delta minus on phosphorus is because it's holding an actual pair of electrons. In other words, that lone pair is going to make it delta negative compared to hydrogen. So please don't confuse those concepts. In the case of water, as we saw before, this is delta negative, this is delta positive. So the interaction between those two is going to be specifically delta minus to delta plus, okay? And since the hydrogen specifically on the since the hydrogen on the water, okay, is interacting with the phosphorus, and even if the oxygen is interacting with the hydrogen, since the water, since the hydrogen and phosphine, that pH three is bonded to phosphorus, that's why it's a dipole dipole attraction. Questions about letter C. Go ahead, ask your question. Great question. How do you know which side of the molecule will be negative or positive? It depends on the electronegativity value for the atom. As we learned yesterday in class, oxygen has an electronegativity value of 3.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1. Let me just write those numbers down. So this is 3.5. This is 2.1. Let me verify that those numbers are correct. And we get those numbers from here. See how oxygen it says 3.5? And hydrogen it says 2.1. That's how we know. So Let me go back to the example. So since oxygen has an electronegativity value of 3.5, that's why we put a delta minus. In the case of hydrogen, it has a value of 2.1. That's why it gets the delta plus. Phosphorus has an electronegativity value of 2.1. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1. Again. When you look at a phosphorus hydrogen bond, you will say, hey, this is a nonpolar covalent bond. But because phosphorus is holding a pair of electrons in this instance, we can actually say, hey, phosphorus is actually holding a pair of electrons, a pair of negative charge. So that will override the electronegativity, and that's why we assign the delta negative on the phosphorus. Put a one in the chat if that makes sense, because I want to make sure that you guys do not confuse, again, bond polarity to overall polarity. 
because you can see that in phosphine, it has nonpolar covalent bonds, but the molecule is polar, and that's because of the presence of that lone pair, okay? So let me just write it here on the notes so people remember. Phosphorus atom is delta negative because of the lone pair in the atom. So this is just a particular case. Let's move on to letter D, okay? We already know that water is a polar molecule. What about sodium chloride? What kind of molecule is that? Sodium chloride, what kind of molecule it is? Excellent, it is ionic. Remember, ionic because it has full ions, meaning something is a cation, something is an anion. So when we look at water and I assign its polarity, we already have seen it throughout here. This is delta negative and this is delta positive, okay? So I can write the interaction to which, uh, whatever part of the molecule, to be honest with you guys. So in this case, I'm going to do it specifically with the partial positive to the full negative here. Okay. So when we have this type of interaction, which is a full ion, because we have an anion and a cation. This is called an ion dipole interaction. Dipole from the idea that water is a polar molecule, ion because we are interacting with a charged species. And similarly, the cation can interact with that oxygen, okay? It's just that for the examples that we were dealing with, I only illustrated one, but for example, in the letter C, the oxygen that is negatively charged, it can, um, sorry, the oxygen that is partial negative, that delta minus in the water can interact with um, the hydrogen in the phosphine. Let me just show that. We could also visualize this as this interaction, okay? It's just that. In order to keep this clean, I'm, I'm just illustrating one. Let me add the markings again. Any questions? If you're given a pair of molecules, can we determine what is the strongest attractive force? Excellent. So this is the end of chapter six. Now we are going to move on to chapter seven. So in chapter seven, now that we know how our pure substances that we know as elements can come together and make ionic compounds and covalent compounds, we know how to draw them. We know how to actually do structures we know how to determine the type of bonds they have we know how to determine their polarity we know how to 
uh, determine the attractive forces that are in them. Now we are going to learn how we can count them in terms of quantities. And in chapter seven, we are also going to learn about chemical reactions that can happen with the molecules that we learn in chapter six. So understand that when we are counting items in chemistry, we have a particular term that we utilize in order to define how we count things in chemistry, okay? And that is a mole, okay? So small particles like atoms and molecules, we count them utilizing the counting method that is called the mole, okay? The mole is actually given by what is called Avogadro's number. And Avogadro's number tells you, as you can see here in the bottom, that a mole of any item is going to equal 6.022 uh, times 10 to the 23 items, okay? Every time. Avogadro says that if you have, for example, you see in the bottom illustrations of one mole of zinc, one mole of carbon, one mole of magnesium, one mole of copper. Whenever I ask you, what is one mole of zinc in terms of atoms? Your answer is going to be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Even if it's one mole of carbon, how many atoms of carbon are in one mole of carbon? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, okay? Now, you may see that I actually put a picture there and you will be like, what? Why is there a picture of guacamole here? Okay. Put a one in the chat if you like Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is my jam. That's where I shop. I love Trader Joe's. I even have the cookbooks of cooking with Trader Joe's. They're really good cookbooks too. Now, I don't know, but this, this I find amusing. Number one, this is my favorite store. But looking through their food, I noticed that you can see here that it says avocados number, guacamole. Now, you may be wondering, who the heck is this guy in the picture that is saying, let's party, arriba? Who the heck is this guy? Guess who that guy is? Based on what I told you. Exactly, that is Avogadro. I was like, this is why I love this store. It just tickles my nerdy jeans. That is Avogadro's. So when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, this is so cute. Again, people would look at me at the store and be like, why do you think that this is cute? I was like, look, they put Avogadro. That guy, that guy is the one that created Avogadro's number. Anyways, I noticed these little things and I get excited because I love science. So I don't know who did that at Trader Joe's, but I got to love it. Also, there are some, you know, not so funny jokes in chemistry about like uh, how the mole can be like a guacamole. But anyways, I haven't even memorized it because I don't find it funny. But the more important thing here is that whenever we're talking about a mole of anything in chemistry, okay? is going to be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd items. That is a particular number that is very important that you guys know, because this is going to be a conversion factor that we're going to utilize often, okay? So the first thing that we're going to learn in terms of calculations is how if we're given molecules of a compound or if we're giving atoms of an element, we can convert it to moles and vice versa. As you can see in the left side of the slide, we have the guide for calculating atoms or molecules of any substance, okay? So we have the following example. It says, how many CO2 molecules are in 0 0.50 moles of CO2, okay? So as I mentioned to you guys, and you will see in the in-class worksheet for chapter seven, we are going to have conversions, okay? 
between moles of element to atoms of that element and vice versa. That's why you have the double headed arrow. Or if you have moles of compounds and molecules of that compound. Now, what is CO2? Is it an element or a compound? What is CO2? Excellent, is a compound. So what we're uh, going to utilize here is this. If we go through the guide of how to solve these problems, it says state the given and needed quantities. What is given to us is the moles of compound. What is needed is going to be molecules of that compound, okay? You can see here that on top of the arrow, I put the conversion factor for this. And this conversion factor establishes that one mole equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd items, and the items in this case is going to be molecules, okay? M-O-L-E-C is going to be my shorthand for molecules. So we're going to utilize dimensional analysis to complete this. So I write what is given, which is 0 0.50 moles of CO2. Now, we already learned previously how we can utilize a conversion factor and turn it into a fraction because we're trying to cancel moles, okay, of CO2. Then I put in the bottom one mole of CO2. On the top, I'm going to put what that mole of CO2 is equal to, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of CO2. So when I do that, my moles of CO2 cancel with each other. So that means that I'm going to take 0 0.50 moles times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. You're gonna divide the whole thing by one. Now, this is where our best friend in the whole wide world comes back, sig figs. When I put this in my calculator, how many sig figs do I need in my final answer? Great job. I need two. Okay. Now, when I see my calculator display, if anybody out there that has a calculator, what answer do you get when you take 0 0.50 times 6.0 to 2 times 10 to the 23rd? What do you guys get? Excellent, that's what I got also. So now we need to round that answer to two sig figs. What that means is that the coefficient, the values before the times 10 to the 23rd need to be rounded to two sig figs. So the answer for this will say 3.0 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of CO2 are present in 0 0.50 moles of CO2, okay? So whenever we're trying to convert from moles of compound and we need to find molecules, we're going to multiply by Avogadro's number, okay? When we have to do the opposite, meaning, that if we have, we are given molecules, but we need to find moles, okay? 
It doesn't matter if we're talking about moles of element and atoms of element or molecules of a compound and moles of a compound. If our direction of what is given and needed is opposite. So if I'm given molecules and I need to find moles, then I'm going to divide by Avogadro's number, okay? So here we have two problems. Put a one in the chat if you're ready to practice. Excellent. Put a two in the chat if you need me to do these problems. If you are going straight to practice, that's fine. Okay, there's at least two students. Great. So you can see here that in number one, we are given 2.00 moles of water. We're trying to find molecules of water. So when we're going from moles to molecules, or moles to atoms in the case of elements, we are always going to use as our conversion factor, Avogadro's number. So in this case, I'm gonna write what is given, 2.00 moles of water. In one mole of water, we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. So I go to my calculator, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd times 2.00. Okay. How many sig figs do I need to put in my final answer? Excellent. So again, Remember that you need to remember to put the correct number of significant figures in your answer. It is important. 1.20 times 10 to the 24 molecules of water. Okay. On number four, and then this is just selected um, examples from the in-class worksheet. We're going from atoms of carbon to moles of carbon. So we're doing the opposite. This is kind of like, so in problem four, we're doing this. We're going from atoms to moles. So that means that we're going to divide by Avogadro's number. Remember that if you're given moles and you want to find atoms, then we're going to multiply by Avogadro's number. So going through that problem. 7.46 times 10 to the 23rd. Atoms of carbon. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Atoms of carbon equal one mole of carbon. So in this case, I'm dividing by Avogadro's number. I have to keep track of my sig figs. So I need three sig figs. I need to round to three sig figs. So if I take 4.46 times 10 to the 23rd and I divide it by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, what do you guys get? Anybody tried it? Let's put it in the chat when we make that division. How many moles? Excellent. I got that also. My calculator display says 1.23879 But when we round it, 
is going to be 1.24. For the student that put times 10 to the 46 power, that means that you enter it incorrectly onto your calculator. Make sure that depending on the calculator that you're using, that whenever we're dividing by Avogadro's number, make sure that you put that number in parentheses. Because if you remember the rules when it comes to division and exponents, technically that times 10 to the 23rd power is going to cancel each other. So you should have only a whole number. So be careful when you enter these numbers onto your calculator. If anybody has questions uh, into how to use your calculator, please make sure to stay after class. Oh, I will be more than happy to show you how to use your calculator or come to office hours next week. Okay. Any questions on how to convert from moles to molecules or from molecules to moles? Understand that these calculations, when it comes to the laboratory, depending on the type of project or what you're actually measuring, may they may be important. I know that at first, when we all take chemistry, we may be like, okay, why am I interested in calculating moles and molecules and grams? And because we're going to see all those calculations. But understand that it mainly comes from the idea that Sometimes experimentally, even though we're working with compounds, after a chemical reaction, we're going to be incorporating specific atoms. And sometimes we're interested at the atomic level, how much quantity of this compound or this element is placed in a particular organ. It depends on the project. But understand that that's why we need to learn how to do those calculations. Or even if we're trying to make some stock of chemicals, which is something that we will be learning how to do in chapter nine, these calculations may come in handy. Excellent. Since there are no questions, let's go to the next topic, which is the idea of understanding the most of an element in a compound when we are utilizing chemical formulas. Okay. So aspirin, as you can see for the uh, the image that we have on the left side of the slide, has this particular structure, okay? This is the ball and stick model for aspirin. In this ball and stick model, carbon is illustrated with those black balls. So this is a carbon, this is a carbon, this is a carbon, this is a carbon, this is carbon, 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 carbon. Oxygen is given by the red balls. So there's one, two, three, four. The white balls are going to be specifically hydrogens. So when we progress to organic chemistry, we are going to learn how these molecules are built. But so far in this class, since we only know chemical formula, this structure is referred right now as having the chemical formula C9, because there's nine carbons, H8, because there are eight hydrogens, O4, because it has four oxygens, okay? Now, the subscript in a chemical formula also has a relationship between the moles of an element to the moles of a molecule. So if we're talking about just molecules themselves, so one molecule of aspirin equals to having nine atoms of carbon, eight atoms of hydrogen, four atoms of oxygen because of the subscript. But we can also define it as a molar amount. In one mole of my compound, because there's a subscript of nine by the carbon, there's nine mole of carbon, there's eight moles of hydrogen, and four moles of oxygen. So whenever you need to understand how many moles of a particular atom I have in my compound, 
then I need to utilize the formula subscript for my conversion, okay? And here we have the following example. We're trying to determine specifically um, how many atoms of oxygen, okay, are going to be present in 0 0.150 moles of aspirin, okay? So when we are doing this, we need to understand that since we are trying to be interested in the atoms of oxygen, and we already learned how to get atoms of oxygen, we need to incorporate one more conversion here. And that more com one more conversion is going to be the moles of an element to, uh, or the moles of the compound to the moles of an element. And the formula subscript is what takes us there. You can see that we have a double-headed arrow, but in this case, we're going specifically in this direction. And the formula subscript is what's going to give us in that direction. We already learned that from moles of element to atoms of element, we do this conversion specifically by using Avogadro's number. So we write here, as you can see, the, uh, the given and the needed quantities. Then we need to write a plan on how to convert from moles of compound To moles of an element, okay? And then we're going to basically write the equalities in order to do this conversion. So when we are trying to do this, let's specify that we're going to write what is given to us. So let's get started with that. Zero point one five zero moles of aspirin my first conversion factor is going to be utilizing my formula subscript to get moles of the element that I'm interested in, which in this case is going to be oxygen, okay so. My conversion tells me that in one mole of my compound, because I'm interested only on the oxygens, there are four moles of oxygen, okay? So I write my equality as a fraction because I'm trying to uh, cancel moles of aspirin. I'm going to say one mole of aspirin. And on top, what that equals to, which is four moles of oxygen. Now, you can see that I'm trying to get to atoms so it's important that you read these questions i want atoms of oxygen and as you can see here when we do this we need to utilize avogadro's number to get the atoms of the element that i'm interested in so you're going to say okay in one mole of the atom that i'm interested in which is oxygen i'm going to put 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of oxygen. If I look at how I'm going to cancel my units, moles of aspirin cancel with moles of aspirin, moles of oxygen with moles of oxygen. So, 
For this problem specifically, I'm going to take 0 0.150, multiply it times four, multiply it times 6.0 to two times 10 to the 23rd. And that's how I get my atoms of oxygen, okay? So I'm going to give you guys a minute, put in your calculator. Let's see if we get the same number. 0.150 I got in my calculator 3.61132 1, times 10 to the 23. Excellent. That's what students got also. Now, based on the value of moles that was given to you in the problem, what do we need to round it to? What value? How many sig figs? Excellent. Three sig figs. So when we round it to three sig figs, we're going to say that this is 3.61 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of oxygen can be found in that many moles of aspirin, okay? So again, when we're going from given moles of a compound and we want atoms of an element to conversion factors, the formula subscript followed by Avogadro's number. Let's do some practice problems before break. Okay. So again, when it comes to this, this is given. You find the moles of the element and then you utilize Avogadro's number to find the atoms of element. Remember that your conversion factor is Avogadro's number. Give me a moment, because I changed the compound, but didn't change the atom here. Okay. Let me just make some changes here so I can read the question the way that it needs to be read. In the first problem, how many atoms of bromine are in 3.5, <clears throat> 3.45? moles of zinc bromide, okay? And in the second question, how many atoms of sulfur are in 2.5 moles of lithium sulfate? So let's do together at least the first question and then we're going to move on to the next one. So here we're starting with zinc bromide. Let's put in the chat, what is the chemical formula of zinc bromide? Excellent job. So zinc bromide 
has a chemical formula of Zn Br2. Okay. So when we set up the dimensional analysis for this, we're going to say 3.45. Moles of CnBr2. We need two conversion factors for this problem. Okay. So if I have one mole of ZnBr2, how many moles of bromine do I have? Just put it in the chat. How many moles of bromine? Exactly. We have two based on the formula subscript. Since I'm interested in the atoms of bromine, then I'm going to say in one mole of bromine, I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of Br. To, co to complete this problem, I'm going to do 3.45 times 2 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. I need to round this value to three sig figs. So what value do you guys get? Excellent. That's what I got also. 4.16 times 10 to the 24 atoms of bromine are in 3.45 moles of zinc bromide. Okay. In the next one that you guys have, we have lithium sulfate. which the chemical formula is Li2SO4. So I'm going to give you guys two minutes to solve the second problem. I'm going to start writing the work that we need to do to solve that problem. 2.5 moles of Li2SO4 and one more 
Li2SO4, this one mole of sulfur. One mole of sulfur equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of sulfur. Great job. I got that value also. One point five times ten to the twenty four atoms of sulfur. Great. Any questions about if you're given moles of a compound, how to get atoms of an element in that compound, or the transition between moles to molecules, molecules to moles, or Moles to atoms, atoms to moles. Any questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Kayla. Um, so I got everything right except the one mole of sulfur. How did you find that? Oh, the subscript. Oh, okay. See how in, in Li2SO4, there's like sulfur doesn't have a number by it. That means that there's a, a number one that is emitted. So that's why we got the one sulfur. So if the question would have asked you about lithium, there will be two moles of uh, lithium. Or if the question would have asked you oxygen, then there will be four moles of oxygen. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, another thing is like, be careful whenever you're doing these examples and you have polyatomic ions that have parentheses, because understand that if you have a polyatomic ion, it's not the case that we have here, but if you have a polyatomic ion and there's parentheses and there's a number outside of the parentheses. So let's say that I'm just gonna write a note here. Let's say that we're dealing with, um, Aluminum uh, cyanide. So ALCN3. And then I ask you for, um, let's say, nitrogen. Here you have one aluminum, you have three carbons, and you have three nitrogens because that value of three gets distributed to the nitrogen and to the carbon. Okay, this is in terms of moles. So in one mole of this compound, there's one mole of aluminum, three of carbon, three of nitrogen. So be careful when you have um, things that are polyatomic ions. Any other questions before we go on break? Excellent. So we will go on break now.